I am so excited to be here with you all today and, um, and to share a message that is on my heart. And I pray that it's going to be a blessing and that the Lord is going to be, you know, just really setting us free to some aspects in our spirituality that um, can kind of dog us and hang with us all of our lives. And these things that I'm going to be talking about today, or the thing, can, can stay right underneath that surface, but it can consume our lives. Um, but as we heard, there's a time this morning that we heard that the Lord just invites us to come and, and sit on the shore with him, have breakfast on the beach with Jesus, and let him just speak to our hearts, as we speak to him. So it's going to be a little bit of a deep, deep dive. I hope that you're all going to be okay with that. <laughs> a little bit of a deep dive, but I'm going to try to break it up and make it as simple as I can. The topic that we're going to be talking about today is the flame of shame. The flame of shame. And we're going to be looking at Peter um, and just his experiences, and, and we're going to we're just going to, we're going to actually see how I come up with that name about a flame of shame, how that is actually revealed in scripture and how I see that coming out. So today, as we're, as we're considering Peter, I want us to be thinking about the various looks, the very gazes, the various ones throughout his whole journey with Jesus that he might have seen in his eye. Because you see, our perception of Jesus, as um, uh, you know, you were you were talking about uh, Susan, how the lie, how 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 the lie can come, and when you have a perception, whether if it's a lie, it distorts the truth of Jesus. So how we see and how we perceive Jesus is going to. Um, as she was talking, as she was testifying, it's going, to, it's going to either catapult us forward into his presence or cause us to shrink back. So that's where we're going to be considering. So trial after trial, success after success, and failure after failure, what did Peter see? But more importantly, more importantly, is what do we see? What do we see? And then also, what do we do with this raging shame that we can experience from time to time when we realize that we have fallen short or missed the mark of being this fully human um, created in the imago Dei, the image of God? What do we do with that? That's what we're considering sin. What do we do with that shame that comes? However... However, I want to say this, my goal for our topic is not to deal, God bless you, primarily with the seven deadly sins, because there are times that shame can come upon us without adultery, without lying, without stealing, right? You can experience, you and I both, we can experience shame, even just with our gospel story. You know, nobody dared ask if it was him. Well, what about Thomas? You know what I mean? Like sometimes you can experience raging shame because you're not fully like, oh, I'm not 100% sure, Jesus, that, you know, you're where you, and, and I don't want my shame to consume me so that I can't get to the feet of Jesus and be real, right? Sometimes, as our brother was saying, a, a shame can be imposed upon you because of a, 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 an ailment that you have or a handicap that you have. And so a completely um, void of your own uh, volition, you can be experiencing sh the flame of shame and that can be consuming us and the Lord would like to put that out. So that's, that's my goal. I think that we can experience this, but I also believe that we all struggle to know our belovedness in Christ Jesus, apart from what we do or what we don't do. We struggle, and this is, this is that conference, I wrote this down, hence that first love conference that's coming. Because we struggle, we know it theoretically, but somehow we still get our worth, it's, it's wrapped up into what we do or don't do. And if we haven't performed right, we just might 
have a little bit of flame of shame rolling around in us. And I believe, I fully believe, that with one look in his eye, that flame can be brought out. I really believe that. We've got to see that truth and we've got to see that, that, that glimpse of his eye. And no matter what ashes we bring, because that flame is going to create some ashes, right? God can make it beauty. God can make it beauty. Amen? Amen. Amen. So our goals today, I've got three goals. We're going to look at a spiritual picture of this flame, and I'm going to explain to you why there's a very specific reason I'm calling it flame of shame, which I'll dig into. And then we're going to discern. You guys had a discerning conference. I'm a spiritual director. I'm in spiritual formation. So discernment is a big thing for us. We're going to discern if or where the flame of shame is consuming our ability to experience the belovedness of God. That's all this is about, is how am I able to experience how much he loves me? That's what this is about. And then number three is to define this. So let's jump in. I want to take a look at this spiritual picture of the flame of shame. Now, folks back then, when the Bible was written, they couldn't read a lot. You know, we have our, icon, our, our icons because how do you express, you know, you know how do you express to a, a, a group of people that doesn't know how to read? You're going to use pictures or you're going to use, if you even go back even further, you're going to use, um, you're going to use language like your, your hieroglyphics here in, um, in Egypt, and so you're going to create a language that comes out of pictures, and the Hebrew texts has just that. So I want to just show us the word for shame and explain how that can work. And we might be like, oh my gosh, that sounds super hard. I'm not a scholar. I don't think that I can understand a word through pictures. And I'm going to say that I don't think that this is true. So I have a couple slides here. Is everybody, who, who, who uses their cell phone? Okay, not everybody has a cell phone. Okay. So has anybody in the house used an emoji? And okay, then you're going to totally understand where this is coming from, right? It's the same, 4,000 years later, we're doing the exact same thing, all right? So through these emojis, let's take a look at the first picture we have here. So <laughs> you see these, these, this ancient language, we're doing the same thing with all of our emojis. So it's a little different, but we can discern through our emojis what somebody is trying to say to us. The second picture, see that? Just, just imagine your emojis. We're 4,000 years later. King Tut was doing, King Tut had a cell phone, you know, and he was doing this, whatever. Let's see the third one. This is actually from an exhibit in Israel where you've got the mummy, and then right next to it, they're, they're displaying this, how this language, this ancient language is very similar to what we're doing today. And then the number, the third, the fourth one, I mean. All right, so you, you, you see this. Like, who would have ever thought, but, you know, my, I'm, I'm upside down. I'm, I'm a little confused. You know, ha I'm dancing. I'm having fun. We have this. I see. I'm seeing. This is bugging me. I'm running. I'm running. Right? So that's exactly, so, so just so I say it, this isn't a hard concept. We get it. We get it. So that said, what does this have to do with shame? Please, somebody ask me, what does this have to do with shame? Because the Hebrew word for shame is buz, and it's created with three letters. And each of these three letters have a picture that goes along with it. And so what we can do is we can, just like when we're texting, we can look at these letters and get what's happening. I mean, is it me? I literally, I will text three, pic three, three emojis to send somebody at send. I've not said a word. All right, so the first letter. The first letter is the letter of a house, of booze. The first letter, the buh, is the letter of a house. Now think, what's the heart of the home, right? I mean, you always think, I can't wait to go home. That's, the, that's where your heart is. Home is where the heart is. 
So, so we're already starting to recognize in the beginning of shame, something is coming deep. We're talking something deep here. Okay, we're talking about heart. The second letter is a nail. So it's representing something that is securing. Something that is securing. It, it literally, in the day, it would have secured their, their, uh, their tent to the ground, their house. So something is securing that. This third letter, the third letter of this is a letter that represents a tooth or something that consumes. It is used to say a consuming fire. In fact, at the gates of Israel, you'll see a shin and the, the El Shaddai is as a consume. Everybody's nodding. You're as a consuming fire. So spiritually speaking, the word shame, spiritually speaking, the end result of shame is a heart that is attached to a consuming fire. Shame is a heart that is attached to a consuming fire. Has anybody ever experienced being attached to a consuming fire of your shame that you can't get away with, you can't get away from, you can't run away, it, it walks around with you. You know, you start feeling good and then you look in the mirror and boof, there it is again. Or somebody reminds you, or somebody overlooks you. And you're experiencing that burning. Your heart is attached to that shame. So can anyone guess where the first, the first place where this word is found in scripture? That's it, Genesis, yes. Where Adam and his Eve were naked and unashamed before God. And you know the story. They had a boundary. God gave them a boundary. They crossed the boundary, and bam, they were experiencing shame. Their heart was attached to something that was consuming them besides Adonai. And then what's the next thing they did is they used the works of their own hands to create a covering. I'm going to tie that into Peter. I can totally identify this because we wear masks. We present ourselves the way we want to be seen. We create, we work, we get degrees, we have accomplishments, trophies, accolades, friends, social media. We can even now, nowadays, we can even present, you know, on social media, we can actually present ourselves the way we want to be seen. Is that any different than Adam and Eve? But what causes them to do that? Shame, fear. I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see me all fixed up. That's shame. That's our heart is attached to this. But here's the raw reality I want us to catch here. Without being fully known, and when I'm presenting myself the way I want to be seen, when I have a mask on or I've sewn fig leaves together and I'm presenting myself, I am not fully known. And if I am not fully known, I can therefore then not be fully loved. And now you know why I say we don't, it's hard for us. That this, and what's at, what's, at, what's at stake here is our experience of how desperately loved we are by the Almighty. That's what at risk. Anybody? Anybody? And yet God calls to them as he calls to us. Where are you? Come, children. Sit with me on this beach a minute. Let's break bread. Let's sup together. I want to talk to you. Now let's take a moment of just discernment with all of this in mind and take a look at Peter again and determine where or if this shame might have been burning inside of him. 
something stood out to me in this text when I was, when I was first studying this that really was the propelling um, scripture of my little word search and digging up this sermon. It was from uh, verse 7 where it says, The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, here's the, th here's the thing. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. So my question for you is, why did Peter feel the need to put something back on? I mean, dude, you're swimming. Do you need to have your robe on to go in the water? And furthermore, what is it that he, why did he feel more comfortable with his friends in that state than he did with Jesus? To me, that was screaming flame of shame. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, put a fig leaf. I'm going to sow a fig leaf. I'm going to whatever, whatever. I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to be a better person next time. I'm going to, you pick your own. You pick your own. Why do we feel less comfortable in our own skin with Jesus than we do with our friends? It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's shame burning inside of us that's preventing us from experiencing the belovedness of God. Now to keep it in context, let's remember the last time that Jesus saw Peter. Remember with me. He locked eyes with Jesus just after he denied him the third time. Whoa, that's a big one to carry around with you. That's a big one. Now, we remember that this is something that Jesus knew he was going to do. And Peter's like, I will never, 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 not me, maybe them, but not me. And the Lord said, yes, son, you will, but that's all right. I mean, th what did he see in his eyes at that moment? You know, like, he probably's like, oh, yeah, Jesus, you're a little wackadoodle. He, he probably thought like, oh, I feel so sorry for Jesus because he thinks I'm going to be doing something I'm not going to do. I don't know, you know. But then, sure enough, you know, he's doing it again. And the scriptures say at Luke, um, at Luke 22 and 60 and 30, if you want to grab this, it says that Peter replied, I do not know the man. I do not know him. And then as Jesus was, uh, as Peter was speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And so the question is, at that moment, when Peter locked eyes with Jesus, he was literally looking face to face with the one that knows him the best, yet also the one who loves him the most. Whew. I mean, that right there, we are locking eyes with the one God who knows us better than we know ourselves, Augustine said, Lord, that I would know myself so that I could know you more. He knows us more than we know ourselves, and he also loves us more than anybody. But yet Peter ran away and wept bitterly. Anybody? Anybody ever run away and weep bitterly when you catch that look in your Lord's eye? And then my question is, what are you seeing in his eye? Susan, what was the name of that thing that you said? Gaslighting. Gaslighting. The one who knows us the best and loves us the most. What do we see in his eyes? Each of us. Each of us have denied Jesus in different ways, in so many different ways, in ways that are so insignificant, and in ways that are incredibly significant. And he knows, and yet he loves. Now I want to go just a touch deeper. Y'all with me still? 
because there's a little bit, psychology, the study of psychology um, has done a wonderful job in making a difference between guilt that we would experience and shame. And I love the study of the mind. So let's consider this distinction so that we can possibly bring healing to our soul. So psychology defines the difference between guilt and shame. That's what that we're talking about here, guilt and shame. As guilt, guilt is a feeling that you get when you did something wrong or you perceive that you did something wrong. Sound fathomable, right? Ready for this? This is psychology. Shame is a feeling that your whole self is wrong. Huge difference. Huge. Let me say it again. Guilt is a feeling you get when you did something wrong or you perceived you did something wrong. Even if it hadn't happened, you can still feel guilty even if it hasn't happened. You can. Shame is a feeling that your whole self is wrong and that may or may not be related to a specific behavior or event. And you see, this isn't about denying behavior. I'm all for that. Listen, you know, God says, the, the, the Bible tells us that the goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. Not the anger of the Lord, not the wrath of the Lord, not the hatred of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord keeps us. So this is, this is Peter had shame. He turned and he went away and he, whipped, he wept bitterly, right? The goodness of the Lord, repentance means to go like this and to go running into his name, to go running to the altar, to go running. to, to, to he, he put his clothes on and he went to the beach and he got to Jesus. Shame wants you to go away. So see, the goodness of the Lord is a good thing. It's a good emotion. And on that place, that's where we can discover, even in the guilt, that we are fully known and fully loved. But if we let shame dictate and drive us away and burn in our soul, we're never going to get to that place at his feet where we can experience his love. And then lastly, I, I think about this. At, for me, I'm a works for worth girl. If you know anything about me, I'm like big on, I, I call it my little blue ribbon syndrome because, huh, you know, I'm 25 years old now and the Lord is just finally free. That was a joke. I'm not really 25. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and really, I'm actually starting to experience this place where the blue ribbon syndrome isn't driving my life. So the blue ribbon syndrome is driving my life because shame was driving my life, right? And so, listen, I have to pr prove myself worthy of this love. Prove myself worthy of what you have done for me instead of just accept it. It's crazy. We know that. But yet, uh, at least me, I'll do it. So watch this with me. This might not be, you might not be identifying with this, but when I was reading this, I was reading about, you know, so, so you're, you're on the boat with your friends, you see Jesus, you put on your garment, and you see him off that, you know, and, he, and, he, and you get there, and he's like, come, get some fish. Well, what's the first thing that Peter does? He jumps into action. Oh, yeah? I'm going to get fish. There's 153. I can do it. Super disciple. Let me get busy, Martha. Let me get busy and serve you, Lord. And serve you, Lord. And serve you, Lord. And I just wonder if maybe that was part of the reason why Jesus says, you know what, son? Go take a little walk. Come walk with me, because you're not experiencing just how beloved you are. Thank you so much for the work. Thank you so much for the service. But I came for more than service. I came for your heart, and I came for you to experience my love. As we were worshiping this morning, I was moved in te into tears. And I just, because I was listening to your worship, and I just, I just felt like the Lord say, this just is just so pleasing to my heart. You have no idea how pleasing it is for me to hear your voice. Scripture says in Song of Simon, let me hear your voice. 
Your voice is sweet. Your voice is beautiful. Your voice is lovely. Shame won't let us do that. And I just wonder if that could be why. So I'll ask you one more time. Not just what did Peter see in Jesus' eye, but more importantly, what do we see in Jesus' eye? What do we see? Because the bottom line is hashtag truth. I have a little emoji of a heart right here. The one who knows us the best loves us the most. As we sit here together, and we move forward into the rest of the, the rest of the service. I, I don't know if you have a song to prepare for. I don't know how the order of the, of the. I don't know the orders of, of the. I have it right here. Hold on. Let me see what we're doing next. <laughs> as we, okay, yeah. So as we move forward, I'm going to ask Michelle to just um, to just sit and just 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 sit in a little bit of music. She's just going to, just for a little bit of reflection, a little bit of quiet, reflection. And I want you to just. Sit on the shore with Jesus for a minute. And I want you to see what's the look that I see in your eye, Lord. What do I see? And allow him to blow the shame away, to blow the flame of shame away. And to take the ashes and make it something beautiful as he looks at you and you experience that the one who knows you the best loves you the most. What do you see in his eye? what you hear in his words. What is his heart? How is his heart moving towards you as you sit? I see him like the great high priest that he is, scooping up the ashes, taking the golden shovel, and scooping them up. Those ashes are beautiful, he says. And out of you, out of your life, I see beauty. I accept you, and I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for the glimpse into your heart this morning.